look in your Bibles at 1 Peter chapter 4 as we continue in our series <coughs> on the church. You may or may not recall, I don't always recall, I have to look back myself, but our series started uh, 13 sermons ago talking about what the church is, and we discussed it, the body of Christ, the household of God, the establishment of the church, the church that Christ builds. We looked at it from every different angle. We looked at the goals of the church. The outside goal of the church is the Great Commission. The mission of the church is to make disciples. And then we talked about the inside goal from Ephesians chapter 4, how that multifaceted goal is to build the church up and to continue to work in us what is pleasing to God. And then we've turned to what the church does, and we have looked and held up in our hands, this is what a church does. A ruling elder in our denomination who I learned to dearly love and appreciate uh, in Yazoo City, Uh, at least that's where he lived, he worshipped in Chula, uh, Mississippi, always told us, I remember him telling us at a conference, he said, what I want you to do, preachers, is to tell us what this, our human heart, ought to be so that we can then compare it to how we are. And in essence, we've tried to do that with the church. As we've seen pictures of what the church ought to be, then we can compare it to who we are and what we are. Today, I would like to talk about the ministering church. What it means to have a ministering church. When I use that term, uh, you often think, well, exactly what does that mean? What kind of term would you use for a church that was acting in God's work as much as they can? Sometimes you hear the term an active church, an active church, or a busy church. I'm not always fond of those kind of terms because I find that often when we get so involved in the programmatic aspects of the church, we lose what we ought to be doing, gathering, worshiping. We begin sometimes to fall into, oh, I don't know, a competition for who can be most active. Or we find ourselves in a legalism that makes us think that we're, we're on two or three different committees or ministry centers. If we're volunteering to do certain things, then God must like us better because we're working so hard. Sometimes people will tell me, oh, we got to get so-and-so to join the church because he's a worker. And part of me says, great. And part of me says, well, I hope for the right reasons. Uh, But we do need to be a working church, a ministering church. What's a ministering church? A church where ministry gets done with one another and to the outside world and where most, if not nearly all people in the church are looking outside themselves and in some way ministering to others. In the context that we have at First Peter, it is so unique because Peter is speaking to a church that's undergoing persecution. It is a church that at the very moment he's writing, is undergoing difficulties beyond which we would ever experience. And yet even though they're suffering and they're being persecuted, Peter insists that they do certain things in the midst of the crisis that they're in. We are in no such such crisis. Our passage will say in 1 Peter chapter 4, the end of all things is at hand. Makes you think of 50 or 60 years ago, people wearing those sandwich boards over their over their shoulders in cities, the end is near. What could Peter have been talking about? Some people think that he is simply saying the Lord could come back at any time. I tend to be a little bit more of those commentators who think that he's talking about 70 AD when the crisis is about to come to the Jerusalem church, even though these people weren't in Jerusalem, and everything was about to change. Everything was about to reverberate through the church Because this book was written just a few years before that momentous event when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman legions. I'm not sure what he says, but he is saying this. Changes are coming. Things are in the offing. This is what you've got to do. He talks about their prayer life. He talks about different aspects about them being sober minded. But he quickly comes to what the church ought to be. In the midst of the crisis. Hear God's word. 
in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 and following. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God might be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I believe, as I told you this morning, that this dovetails what we saw this morning in you learning how to see yourself in God's eyes and then becoming useful in the church. Becoming useful is becoming part of ministry in the church. And so, in a sense, Peter is picking up where Paul leaves off and talks about the characteristic of a ministering church. I offer you three chief characteristics of a church that I could look at, that you could look at, and we would say that church is a ministering church. First of all, a ministering church interacts with visible love. They love each other, and their interaction is loving at all times. Ministering churches reach out continually, daily, Sunday by Sunday, to each other, even greeting one another in the Lord. The holy kiss that was done in those days, don't try it here. It may not be part of our culture, but it is indeed the greetings and the warmth that we feel. That's part of becoming a ministering church, but it goes even further. Look at verse 8. Above all, this is important, keep loving one another earnestly. Earnestly is a good word here. The depth of the word is demonstrated by the fact that in the Greek language, this is a word that is often used of athletic endeavor. Love each other like it's a race, in other words. Love each other like it's in overtime and the next basket scores. Love each other as though you're on the 10 line and there's one 10 yard line and there's one man between you and the end zone. Love each other as though you're serving on the very last serve to win the U.S. Open in tennis. Love each other like you're lining up for the Masters and you've just got one putt to win the whole thing. Love each other with that kind of intensity and focus. Notice how interesting it is that Peter is talking to them about how important relationships are by using the interesting term that we see Paul use a great deal, one another. Notice in verse 8, above all, keep loving one another. Verse 9, show hospitality to one another. Verse 10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. This is what it means. When the going gets tough, Christians get closer together. And whether the going is tough right now out there or not for the church, we need to stick together and to function together in love. Now, there's some, there's some additions to that interacting with visible love that gives us a better look at what it really means. Notice he says in verse 8, love covers a multitude of sins. Yes, there have been some people who have interpreted that to mean that if you do lots of service, your sins get forgiven. Uh, the medieval church understood it that way. I think it's much better to understand that people who minister forgive quickly and are forgiven quickly. Somebody who, who does a lot of things and ministers to a lot of people, the work that you do by reaching out into others' lives, by loving each other, by tangibly touching their hearts even if you're a little awkward, if you hurt a feeling once in a while, if you forget to return a phone call, if you do something maybe even a little more bizarre, it's easily forgiven if you are ministering. But also, if you're ministering to other people, it's an interesting fact that 
other people don't bother you so much when you're trying to do some good to them. When you're ministering to others, when you're intent in encouraging five people before you leave church, every service you go to. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever thought, before I get out the door, I'm going to encourage five people? Not before they get out the door, I'm going to check and make sure that one of the doctors has seen that lump on my arm. Uh, Or before they leave, I want to make sure that we really figure it out. How come Alabama, one lost, Auburn, one lost, et cetera, et cetera. Before I get out the door today, I'm going to encourage, greet strongly, say something good to five people. If you do that, if you accept that kind of challenge, you will easily overlook their oddities. All you're thinking about is trying to do what God's called you to do. And if they're strange or odd, and if they come to you and say, what, 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 what? It doesn't bother you. You're out to give. People who minister forgive quickly and are forgiven quickly. People who minister and to interact with visible love are demonstrated by the fact that they give up their stuff easily. Verse 9, show hospitality (coughs) to one another without grumbling hospitality. Now, many of you know from your New Testament studies that when Paul and Peter are talking about hospitality in the New Testament, he is frequently talking about not being afraid to house Christian evangelists or speakers when they come into your town. I can remember when I first came and I was looking at all the big names of the Presbyterians who had spoken here over the years. I was always told, and they always stayed in the prophet's chamber at Miss Buff's house. Now, have you been around here long enough to know the prophet's chamber at Miss Buff's house? It was the renovated garage that was exactly a hotel room. And Miss Buff, didn't she keep almost every speaker who came here in the prophet's chamber up there on that street? Interestingly enough, Lindsay Stackhouse has purchased that home. You ought to see it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's been redone on the inside, but she's still got a prophet's chamber there too. That's kind of a hospitality that was talked about in the New Testament, but I think it extends to just plain giving up what you are to others. Your time, your time. Don't begrudge. Don't begrudge your time to the church. Don't begrudge a meeting here and there that you need to go to. Indeed, give it up. Give up your talent. Give up your possessions if you need to. Give up your money when it's time to give up your money. I'm not talking about tithing. I'm assuming tithing. But I'm talking about those extra gifts to those who need it. The extra instinct to touch others with the possessions that you have given. Do we want to be a ministering church? If we are, we have to interact with visible love that we get to know each other and we reach out to each other and we are known as Christians by our love. Two examples that I want to share, a negative example and a positive example. When I was working as an intern at a church back in West Virginia, which happened to be my home church, which made it a little difficult, the church was, in essence, falling apart. I've told you the story of this. In the 16 months I was there, I had four senior pastors. How about that for an internship, Scott? Four senior pastors. One of them, of course, was an interim pastor during that period. Actually, two were interim pastors, and really all four of them were pretty interim, if you ask me. It was a crazy time there. And we had some congregational meetings to start talking about things. And there was a movement within the younger people in the church to do more to develop fellowship in the church. But it was being resisted by some that are old. I won't tell you all of the story. Both sides were not exactly right on the way they were approaching it. But one of my friends who was in my wedding stood up and he was, oh, he just hated to speak in public, but he was in a church service. And and he said, you know, all we want is to get to know each other better. Now, this friend who was in my wedding had grown up in that church and was 22 years old at the time that he stood up and made that statement. He had never been to any other church. He was always there. Another gentleman stood up and said, well, we love everybody. And he pointed and he said, young man. I have no idea who you are, but I love you. And I thought to myself, he's been in this church 22 years, 
and you don't know who he is? That's not a ministering church, is it? Now, if you're one of those older people here today, I hope you know at least the ones who have grown up here. You see, that's the negative. That's not a ministering church. But I went to seminary, and when I went to St. Louis to seminary, I, I decided on a church, and, and when my wife and I were, were freshly married after my first year of seminary, between my first and second year in seminary, one of the first weeks I went to that church, I was approached by a gentleman who I knew to be someone who, who worked around the seminary in some capacity. I think he was working in the bookstore. He says, I want you to come to my home for dinner on Sunday after church. And I said, Sure. I said, sure, excited about it, but because though my wife was a wonderful cook, all I could think of was the spread that my mother would lay out on Sunday after church. My mother was never satisfied with one meat. It wasn't just chicken. It was chicken and roast beef. It wasn't just one vegetable. It was six vegetables. And it, it, it was just a spread. And so I kind of was anticipating it. You know, one little bowl of cereal in the morning, can't wait, can't wait, slurping around a little bit get to their house, very modest house, and we went in, and lunch was a half a cheese sandwich, half of a grilled cheese sandwich, and a small bowl of tomato soup. I thought to myself, not bad appetizer, cleanse the palate. <laughs> that was it. And then the more I talked to them, the more I realized that's what they had. And it wasn't just me. He'd invited three other young couples his name was Mr. Collison, and I'll never forget that day because he gave of what he had, and it was one of the best Sunday meals I've ever had. I can't have tomato soup without me thinking about that day, maybe because I wasn't anticipating somebody who didn't have very much being so willing to give it to somebody else. Ministering church reaches out to each other with her stuff. Secondly, a ministering church is filled with active servants. Active servants. Look at verse 10. As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's far, uh, varied grace. Now, we mentioned it this morning. There's a lot of talk about spiritual gifts if you go to 12 different PCA churches, much less Baptist churches or Methodist churches or Bible churches. You'll get all kinds of different definitions about the concept of spiritual gifts. I'm not opposed to, quote, giving a test for spiritual gifts because some of those more psychologically type tests will at least tell you where your natural talents tend to be, which I think are part of spiritual gifts. Again, I think spiritual gifts are talents and abilities, some of which are natural, that the Spirit adds to and enhances for spiritual purposes to be used within God's church and to extend His kingdom. Here, each one of you, as Romans tells us, and as 1 Corinthians tells us, everyone has a spiritual gift. Now, I don't necessarily think it's important for you today to say, okay, here's my three spiritual gifts. Very honestly, I've taken a dozen of those tests. I have worked through all that stuff, and I'm still not exactly sure what my spiritual gifts are. If you would say, well, what are your spiritual gifts in biblical standpoint? Well, I'm sort of like that college group I was in that gave spiritual gifts tests, and if they couldn't figure out anybody else, they just told him his gift was encouragement because that was all they could think of. And so I was always told my gift was encouragement. And if you know me, I'm a nasty man. My gift is not encouragement. My gift is discouragement most of the time. It's not always easy to pinpoint your gifts until you serve God. You find out your gifts as you're moving. These come from God, look at verse 10, as stewards of God's very grace. God gives these things from him. And every gift you have that can be used in ministry and that is used in ministry is a gift that he gave you to use. And every one of you've got it. Every one of you've got one. You might be ministering in this church right now, not according to your particular spiritual gift, but you're serving 
And as you serve in one place where you're not particularly gifted, as you begin realizing that, that this is not working necessarily as well as I'd like it, I don't seem to have a knack for this, it isn't going that well, you go from one thing to the next and you find out what your gift is. You study the list in 1 Corinthians 12 and in 14. You study the list in Romans 8. You look at these lists, or Romans 12, you look at these lists and you get ideas about maybe what some of yours are, though yours might not be one of those written down. Whatever you can do that is used by God and developed within the church is a gift that you have. So what do we do? Well, Peter divides the gifts into two, and that's the best place to start. The best place to start is, are you a talker or are you a server? Now, some of you are both, and that's good too. You can have more than one, you know. But if you're a talker, you should use your talking. If you're a talker, you should use your talking. Look at verse 11. <coughs> Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God... Now, what he's saying here is that if you talk and if God uses anything you do in the talking realm, be it encouragement, be it teaching, be it preaching, be it sharing, be it those kinds of things where you build others up with what you say, maybe even administrative and organizational talents, all those talents that are used that involve talking, do it as though God were on your shoulders, so to speak. I hope that's not offensive watching and listening to everything you do and that you're his messenger we are not revelators as the prophets and apostles were but peter is saying if you do speak speak the words that you know god wants people to hear that could be in sunday school teaching the little ones it could be unofficial it could be chatting it could be talking through problems it could be counseling but some of us need to use your talking because some of you are pretty good talkers. It's fascinating. I've got four chil children. I've got two talkers and two doers. Isn't that amazing? It's the way we're made, but frequently the way we're made is the springboard for the way we ought to use our gifts in the church. Some of you need to use your talking. Some of you should use your hands and feet, that is, to serve. Look at the last part of verse 11. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. You may not be a talker. You may not feel comfortable teaching. You may not feel comfortable lifting up your voice and leading us in prayer from time to time. Though our, our Wednesday and Sunday prayer meetings are not necessarily prayers where you have to have a gift in order to pray. God does give a gift of public prayer. And it is always, always a powerful encouragement to hear others pray when they have that gift of public prayer. But some of you can do, can do. You can fix, you can help, you can run an errand, you can give. And even Peter makes sure that we know that we can't get too awfully prideful about that. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. You can't get proud of it. You can't depend on it for your salvation. It's only what God has given you. What are you doing in the church? Are you talking or are you serving? There are positions that are needed. Ministry center. Sunday school teacher, VBS, it's already over. Boy, it would have been a good one right before VBS, right, Nicole? It would have been good to talk to you about that. There's always a place to serve or to speak, but you need to do one of the other. And the variety of serving and speaking is almost endless. But here's also a problem I have seen with those who are specialists in spiritual gifts. I remember a friend of mine who served as an elder at one of my churches had taken a spiritual gift analysis test and he had decided that his spiritual gift was in the teaching realm. What he did though is he pegged himself as the teacher and he wouldn't do anything else. One day we were in the foyer of our church and one of our children took a header. 
I think they had one of those little sippy cups, you know. They still have sippy cups, you know. They st- and the child took a header across the tile. And the grape juice, oh, the grape juice, went everywhere. And several people began to say, oh, oh, oh. And the fellow that I told you said, as others rushed to help the child, he said, it's not my gift. Oh, my. Oh, my. It's your providence is what it is. Pick the baby up. Get a paper towel. Serve. That's why I've always emphasized in my ministry, not so much pegging yourself for your gifts, but just get in there. And sometimes you will be presented with opportunities to do something that you're not good at and that you know is not part of your gifting package, but it's sitting right there in front of you. The baby has just slid across the tile floor. And there it is. It's time. You got to serve, you got to minister, you got to do somebody, you got to do something. One of the ones who have trouble walking are having a little trouble on the stairs. It's time to move. It's time to help them. Somebody has dropped something. And for some of us, children, did you know that for some of us, when we drop things, it is an adventure when we go down to get them. It is an adventure. I'd like to particularly say that if you've been standing up in front of a crowd, walking around and talking for about an hour, I can't bend over after I preach. I have no idea why. If I drop my glasses, you who bend over with freedom serve, help, jump in. You see, it's not so much that every job gets filled. And what I probably ought to have done tonight was to bring you the list of all the jobs we have like we do in our church membership survey. But it's that service gets done. When we are that kind of people who pick up a child, who pick up a pencil, who help somebody who's moving around, who see a box that somebody needs to carry and we grab it and pick it up. Or when we see somebody weeping or having surgery the next day, sitting in a pew by themselves. Sometimes you got to speak and sometimes you got to serve. That's a ministering church. Third characteristic, a true ministering church cares most about God's glory, about God's glory. Now, I think this is an important aspect of a ministry church, a ministering church. In verse 11, it says, if anyone speaks, whoever speaks the oracles of God serves, serves with the strength God supplies. Now, look in verse 11, in order that, here's a purpose statement, this is why we love each other. This is why we serve that everything, in everything God might be glorified through Jesus Christ. Here's the result. Here's the point. This is what a ministering church gets. God is going to be glorified. Isn't there some casual saying? I should have Googled this. Some of you will probably Google it before you leave this room. It is, what is the phrase? It's almost unlimited what can be done if nobody cares who gets credit. Something like that. You've heard that before, haven't you? Now I know I've got everybody on the Google. I'm going I'm to lose every one of you now. But here's the better point, the more Christian quote. It's amazing what can be done in a church where everybody is making sure that God gets the credit. You see, that means when you're out ministering, you don't care whether anybody notices or not. When you're teaching Sunday school, as difficult as it is, if nobody says thank you, if nobody says good job, if nobody holds a party for you, and we probably ought to have a party for those of you who have labored long doing Sunday school with small children particularly, if nobody says you did a great job, if nobody appreciates the fact that you picked up the pen for the preacher that couldn't bend over, then it doesn't matter. If you have a burden to give a financial gift to the church that you know will be used to help somebody in financial difficulty, you don't care whether anybody knows it was given or not. I was talking to one person in one of my churches one time and She asked me, she said, I noticed in the bulletin that you encouraged us if we did not want to give it to the church 
in our name, we could give anonymously to the denominational agency. And I said, yes, you can. You can do it in such a way that it's anonymous. And she said, why would I want to be anonymous if I gave money? <laughs> <coughs> That's exactly what I did. <coughs> Wouldn't you want to be anonymous if you gave the money? No, <laughs> she said. I don't think she was talking about tax exemptions either. She was talking about credit. She was talking about credit. No, but the best church, the ministering church, is where everything that is done is done for him. Some of us are more bold in going out and doing things for God's glory. But don't expect a return in this life. Sometimes that happens, you know. Sometimes that happens. What does it say here? To him belong glory. To him belong credit. To him belongs looking good. Not because I can go to General Assembly and say, gentlemen, I've got a ministering church. Preachers really don't do that kind of thing. Mostly they complain when they go to General Assembly. It's not so that we can brag about our church, but that we can actually see the way God works. The best church is one where it's all done for him. But the best church is also one where Christ is the motivation for us. Notice it says, to him be long glory, and at the end of our passage, and dominion forever and ever. Dominion. That tells me a lot about the work of Jesus Christ. First he came, and he lived, and he died, and he rose again from the dead, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And he deserves all the credit, but he also deserves the lordship of everything. And as we serve, because Christ has touched our hearts, we then want to see the church run like Jesus is the Lord. One of Scott's professors that he just left in seminary wrote a great book. I haven't read much of the book, but it's got a great title, How Jesus Runs the Church. How Jesus Runs the Church. And here you were looking around to see which of the elders you thought was really in charge around here. May it never be that one of the elders is ever in charge around here, including a teaching elder. May Christ run the church. That's a church that cares about God's glory. What would it look like? Have you ever seen happy ants, kids? Have you ever seen ants carrying things back and forth to the ant pile to take to the queen? They always look so happy, don't they? But they're always so busy. Maybe a good church would be a church that looks like happy ants. Busy. But for the glory of God and not for themselves. Well, most of us, when we are busy, we in unconsciously expect some wages, some credit, some pat on the back. We all do, don't we? But you know, when you do things for the church and for each other, expecting nothing but for God to get the glory, it's exhilarating. Some of you can testify to that, can't you? It's exhilarating. It's freeing. It makes you happy because if you know Christ and you know that he has forgiven you and you're living in his house with his people and that the work that he did outside of you has changed your life forever, you can give selfless service, not expecting anything in return and realizing that all the work that you do doesn't earn your way into heaven, but is a response of the forgiveness that God has already given you. That's powerful. And it's powerful as a witness as well for others who do not know Christ to see a ministering church in action that doesn't care who gets the credit. If you don't know that kind of life today, you maybe need to come to Jesus. You need to ask him to forgive you and to cleanse your heart and to give you the spiritual gifts that you need to really make a difference and touch the lives of others in the church and outside the church. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Ask Christ to save you too, where you can be one of the happy few, not only fellowshipping, but ministering. And finally, church, does that sound like us? Some of it does. 
but some of us aren't doing really anything. Well, don't do it for salvation's sake, but do it because you were saved. Find something. Pray specifically right now. God, make it clear to me how I can serve the church. Start with common acts of love. And those of you who are doing, let's look back on our passage in verse 9. Stop grumbling. I'm watching my finger come back at me when I say that. If you are doing, stop grumbling and look for Christ's credit. And some of you who are maybe burnt out because nobody has told you how good at this you are, give credit to Jesus. Servants get tired, but they don't often get burnt out for lack of credit. When I'm ready to quit, it's frequently because my attitude is not right. I've got a dirty, rotten attitude. My DRAs make me tired of ministering. Look to your attitude. And remember Jesus. He who came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. Let's pray. God, our Father, we ask you that you would make us a ministering church for your glory. Give us the joy of busyness that is not programmatic, but is simply hearts reaching into other hearts as you give us opportunity and if providence gives us opening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.